This is the Open University. <laughs> Architecture plus Urbanism. It's a Japanese magazine and this is the current edition and um, it's a special edition on architecture in the 70s. And I was um, very attracted to this uh, photograph on the front and thought, um, I recognise that, that's got to be a Richard Rogers building. I'm pretty sure it's the uh, house he built in Wimbledon for his parents in uh, the early 70s. I think, or the late 60s, um, which was part of his uh, concept of zip-up architecture, where he, he got um, refrigeration panels and um, train parts and zipped them together to form architecture. And they proved to be very good insulation. Uh, here you can see um, refrigeration units painted yellow, and they've simply been joined together to make a, a wall with windows. And... Um, I looked online and I looked at the, um, the original concept he had for his parents' house in Wimbledon, and which was actually very adventurous and had uh, uh, much more interesting angles. And then the final building, or it's actually three buildings built uh, throughout the garden, one of them built by his son at the end to provide an extra, um, I think it was a pottery workshop. And it's now used by architecture students. Harvard Architecture School uses it and bought it. And um, it went on the market in 2014 and wasn't built and then was acquired in 2016 for a uh, donated by somebody, maybe by Rogers himself, I'm not sure, to the Harvard University architecture faculty. And, um, but when I looked at the photographs, I saw that it wasn't this uh, same design. It was slightly different. It didn't have these sort of ventilation shafts at the top. And um, I thought, now, where could this be? And uh, after a lot of Googling and research, I found that it's uh, building in Tadworth on an industrial estate. And um, it used to be, um, it was commissioned by, I think it's called the UOP perfume manufacturers, who wanted a laboratory for researching into um, perfumes and a, an administrative centre in uh, Kent for their business. So they actually originally commissioned this in 1969. It was the completed in 74, uh, there was some problem initially and it didn't get um, completed until then. And in the meantime, <clears throat> it's actually a, a, a building not just by Richard Rogers, but by Renzo Piano. So it's one of the only two extant buildings in Britain by Rogers and Piano, who of course are famous for the Pompidou Centre in Paris and were working at this time on the Pompidou Centre. So it's historically very important building. Um, <clears throat> The more I researched into it, though, the more sad I became. Um, it's no longer... I looked on Google Street View to see what it looked like now. It is still there, at least on Google Street View, it's still there, hidden behind a hedge in an extremely ugly housing estate in Tadworth. And uh, you can just see from the gate... First of all, it, it's, uh, there's a, a sign saying it's um, being sold by some Canadian real estate company. And uh, it's also uh, gone grey. It's a very grey kind of shabby building now, very weathered, obviously in disrepair. And um, it doesn't look uh, glamorous like, uh, like it does in these pictures. Later on in this uh, issue, you get um, uh, more pictures of it as it was at the time. And it, actually, it, just, it follows a really interesting Rainer Bannum article about um, uh, Foster partners um, and uh, a controversy uh, surrounding Reba Awards and things. Um, a rather feisty essay about uh, um, a concept they were calling long life, loose fit, low energy. Uh, and actually a computer company had um, commissioned uh, Foster, Norman Foster, to build a, I think it was IBM actually, to build um, a building which was supposed to be low energy and super ecological, but actually because it was uh, running computers and had been um, kind of sewn together with sheets of glass, it required a lot of air conditioning to keep it uh, from, to keep the computers cool, but also to keep from cond condensation from forming around the, the pins pinning the glass together. But um, this is a picture of the building 
as it was in 1974 when it first opened. I would have been reading Design Magazine at about this time. I was a, a, a fan of uh, this kind of, precisely this kind of image of modernity. It looks like a spacecraft. Um, it's got the um, sort of almost obligatory Ames chairs there um, in the kitchenette. And uh, it must have been a very pleasant place to work. And of course, they, they run pictures of the Pompidou Center too, because that was the building that Rogers and Piano um, got famous by making. Um, and of course, it was itself very controversial, and uh, a lot of people didn't think it fitted Paris. I mean, it didn't. That was the whole point that it looked like an oil refinery or a space station just set down in the middle of this medieval city next to Le Marais. But um, these same issues have plagued and dogged pretty much everything Rogers has done. And um, the uh, unfortunately, um, the <laughs> the Rogers building is the yellow one is being demolished as we speak. Uh, it was assessed in 2017 by Historic England for um, listing, and they decided it was not um, worth listing. So I found the document that actually um, the <laughs> planning committee from R Rygate and Banstead Borough Council, and um, <clears throat> you can actually find a PDF of the, the document which um, discusses demolition of this building. Um, it may have been demolished already, I'm really not sure. And um, it's, it's a very sad, really a, <laughs> a kind of a symbol of modern Britain in a way. Two planning committee date, 5th of September 2018, report of the head of places and planning. So it's a full application for the demolition of an existing industrial building and the erection of 25 dwellings comprising a mixture of flats and houses with associated access, parking and landscaping. Um, and 17 of the proposed dwellings would be starter homes. So this is their, their pitch for the virtue of what they're proposing, is that these would be homes that would get uh, future home buyers onto the housing ladder. Um, so they, they do mention that the existing industrial building on the site, the former United Oil Products UOP Fragrances Factory, is by prominent architects Richard Rogers and Renzo Piano. Whilst the building is unlisted, uh, it's considered to have some, albeit low to moderate, significance given its historical and architectural associations and could therefore be considered a non-designated heritage asset for the purposes of national policy. Um, but they, they say that uh, the loss of the building would be offset by the public benefits of providing new homes and the limited likelihood of finding a viable use in the foreseeable future to en enable its conservation. So basically they're saying that to get it back into the state that we see it in those photographs would take too much money and that the ha it had been on the market and nobody had been interested for years. So uh, they recommend demolition. And um, it's, uh, it's full of the usual kind of calls to, you know, it says that the, the, the building as it stands does not fit in with the local surroundings. This is one of the things that planning always tells you when you propose a really interesting building, you know, you, you, it, it doesn't fit in with the mediocrity around it and therefore it um, can't be built. And um, also there's a lot of concern about whether the traffic, whether their proposed scheme would increase traffic and they've consulted with the highway people and, you know, pathetic. Um, here's, here's a bit, and coming to the decision not to list it, uh, Historic England does, not, uh, does identify that the building has some claims to architectural and historic interest, notably in being an early work by Richard Rogers and Renzo Piano, only one of two by the pair in England, and its innovation in materials and concepts. However, on both fronts, it was ultimately concluded by Historic England to be insufficient to merit listing at a national level, having considered the building's place within the high-tech movement generally, and against other examples of the technologies and design themes which the building embodies, and other examples of Rogers and Piano's work. So he, he's Lord Rogers now, but it's, apparently that's not enough. You know, he's been sort of integrated into this sort of crotchety, crusty old um, feudal <laughs> superstructure of... Uh, unconstitutional Britain, but um, that in itself is not enough to have um, made his early buildings worth keeping, apparently. So um, I'll be interested to see what they put in its place. I'm sure there'll be some sort of pathetic retro design in these houses. They'll kind of try to look like uh, Poundbury or, or something. They'll be kind of trad and mediocre 
and um, will fit in with what's around them, which is also mediocre, although not quite so trad because it's mostly 1940s and 50s um, building. So um, it just seems, it seems that modernity in Britain was a very brief flash in the pan and that um, even now when there are sort of brutalism appreciation societies and things, it's uh, not enough um, for its monuments to be preserved. You'd think one of only two Renzo Piano and Richard Rogers buildings would be preserved. Apparently not. Um, it just seems like that, that whole... Because my first vision when I looked at those pictures was, gosh, where is that? I wonder if it still stands and I wonder if I could live there, if I could refurbish it. I went off in, 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 sort of down a rabbit hole of fantasy about living in that kind of building and restoring it, and, you know, um, having a space age kind of existence. And I don't see why the people they're proposing to house in, you know, Mock Tudor, whatever they're going to do, could not live in um, a restored Rogers and Piano building like that. Why not? Is it really so far-fetched? Yes, of course. Yes, Nicholas, it's far-fetched. England is, in particular is not like that. Um, it's not the kind of place with the kind of imagination where they would restore a 1974 building which looked like a space station and redesignate it for residential use. So um, that's a sad tale, really. And uh, it's funny that it, the building... The same, the very month that it should be demolished appears on the cover of a Japanese architecture magazine. The Japanese can then imagine that, you know, we have a plethora of such buildings in Britain um, when in fact we're destroying them as much as possible, demolishing them. Um, you know, read Owen Hatterley's tweets for more similar stories. Um, it's happening all the time. And um, of course, probably Richard Rogers, when he built that factory, didn't imagine it was going to still be around in 50 or 60 years. That was the sort of designated lifespan of a building like that, which kind of does look like a temporary structure. So perhaps he's not too concerned, I don't know. But um, And perhaps the photographs and the memories are sufficient. I don't know what happened to the United Oil Products Company and why they folded and uh, stopped making perfumes. Perhaps perfume in itself went out of fashion. Um, perhaps other people did better perfumes. I don't know. But... Um, it seems sad, and, and I kind of connect it in my mind to a, a Facebook uh, post that a friend of mine who lives in Brighton made recently where he talked about uh, having seen a man in, in Brighton attacked for wearing a hat. Once, of course, hats would have been de rigueur, and to be a man and walk down the street without a hat would be shocking and possibly invite violence. But um, this man happened, I guess, in the 80s when hats were no longer a thing. And this man was attacked by hooligans. And we've all kind of been there. Um, there is, in my memoir, Anish, there is a, an episode in which I am attacked by um, people in a, a village, in the village of Dedham. Um, I've got some um, Venetian brown velvet flares on. And I'm with my actually rather conservative school friend, John, who's not wearing any kind of flares. Uh, this is 1972. And uh, a couple of self-appointed fashion policemen i.e. boys our own age, approach us and say to me, those are poofy pants, aren't they? And I try a sort of milk toast relativism and say, well, you may see them that way. <laughs> um, that, and that's your right. And I will defend it to the death kind of argument. But that doesn't um, wash with them. And we're led away to this little leafy lane, a, a footpath nearby, and beaten around the head in a kind of half-hearted way. And then we just cycle home, having been punished, taken our punishment, not very much like men, and um, weeping, you know, on our bicycles as we return home. And we tell my father about it. And then a couple of days later at a village fete, we see uh, the two lads in question and point them out to my dad. But he doesn't, he's not going to be a self-appointed um, morality policeman or, or fashion correction policeman. Um, so nothing happens, but it just, I think we've all, anyone who's lived, especially in a small town in England, um, kind of knows what it's like to be different. This relates also to a, a, an article that was in the Financial Times this week, where somebody, a British person had gone to Tokyo. I think he was a, an employee of the Financial Times who'd got a job in Tokyo, because of course the Financial Times is owned by Nikkei, which is a Japanese company. 
and um, he'd spent a year in, in Tokyo, and he was just talking about how he felt um, liberated by the possibility of walking around the streets of Tokyo wearing clothes that were brighter and more flamboyant than he felt he could get away with on the streets of London. And that's very much my experience as well. I could totally identify with that. He, he, would, he, he was experimenting also with like uniform and um, Nika Zubon and you know these sort of carpenter pants that I wear sometimes. And uh, he really felt liberated. And then he was uh, unfortunately uh, last year sent back to London um, to live again in this kind of repressive and risky uh, environment of England, and not so much London, central London, but there are, there are certainly smaller towns uh, where it's you kind of take your life in your hands wearing the wrong things. It's, it's ironic that the, the anecdote about, about Brighton, that is, Brighton is a place known for a large gay population. This writer in the FT was gay. And um, so it is. it all goes hand in hand with intolerance of homosexuality. We have the story today trending here in Germany that uh, Rewe, which is the one of the big supermarket chains here, has been flying the rainbow flag outside its stores to uh, announce its gay friendliness and that this is uh, leading some bigoted people to boycott the chain. The other, the other big um, controversy just now is uh, the Whitney Museum in New York. Um, uh, one of their board members had, been, uh, had owned a a company which was um, making tear gas, and he was forced to resign by activists, uh, quite rightly, you know, um, last year. And the Whitney is now in trouble again because it's put on an exhibition, you know, full of good intentions, but it's a Black Lives Matter related exhibition in which they bought a lot of work which was contributed by black artists for a charitable sale. So the work was sold, you know, $100 or something. And uh, that was to raise money for Black Lives Matter. But then the Whitney acquired it and has sh is showing the work. This was not the intention of the artists who contributed their work in the first place, and they're not being paid at market rates for this work. Um, so a lot of critique at, uh, of the Whitney. Uh, you know, I was employed by the Whitney in 2006 to, to be an unreliable tour guide, and I was also <clears throat> within the remit of institutional critique, which they allowed me, I was critiquing their um, Altria uh, sponsorship and all the rest of it. So, you know, the question then becomes, where is the clean money? Where is the money clean enough? You know, is it the sugar money that Tate, the Tate Modern and Tate Britain is founded on? Um, would it be food money, tobacco money, arms money? Uh, there is really very little clean money when you come down to it. Um, how do you make clean money? Uh, and is the art world just a place for gestures and for, as, as people are saying uh, about the Whitney, art washing? Is it like green washing, art washing? If you call people out for art washing or green washing for that matter, um, are you actually damaging the cause of at least liberal ideas more than you're actually um, exposing hypocrisy? What's the point of exposing hypocrisy uh, when you simply set back progressive causes. So all this stuff is up, <laughs> is out there just now, and it's the kind of stuff you waste time with when you're online. Um, so I think I'll go back to my Japanese magazines and just look at the, the nice yellow color uh, of a nice progressive time. Maybe it wasn't a progressive time, maybe it was yellow washing. Open University.